we've uh, really appreciate the for those people that have that are joining us. Um, really appreciate your support. This is a very late in the um, late in the the day session. So um, this was really a fifteen minute session, and there's going to be a little bit that blows a few people's minds here if you are a mortgage broker. So Shane, I want to call out. We're, we're having a very short. Um, very short session today because I don't want to get caught up, but I want to focus on three areas for best interest duty and just get you to call out a little bit about how best interest duty evolved for financial planning. Now I'll, I'll set the scene because Shane's a lot younger than me, slightly better looking, but a little, a little bit younger. So back in the day for those people that, that aren't aware, Financial planning used to be uh, people knocking door to door, selling managed funds, um, not knowing and caring about clients. And it, it is a profession that has really evolved. It, it's gone from a door to door, literally a door to door salesman back in the day to, to a proper profession in itself. You know, to be a financial planner, currently to, to have the standing of someone like Shane means that you've done an incredible amount of, of work in terms of pieces of paper. You've really had, um, you've had a lot examined. So maybe Shane, to start off, can you tell the, the, pe the people that are on this call what it takes to be a financial planner in 2020? Well, thick skin, because uh, there's always uh, bad news, that's for sure. Um, that's what the papers print, don't they? That's what readers want to um, read. Um, look, it's just a lot of dedication. Um, if Unfortunately, you know, like mortgage brokers, it doesn't stop, you know, it's on a nine to five. Um, you're looking after clients nearly all hours of the, the day, um, even weekends sometimes, because emergencies just pop up. Um, so look, yeah, you just got to be passionate, dedicated. Um, and again, just got to, the knowledge, like you, you know yourselves, um, CPD points. You just got to be on top of things because, um, I guess, legislation, um, like you know, the rules that um, the mortgage industry are obviously going to have to abide by soon. It's just, just keeps being piled on, and piled on. So, and just yeah, a bit of dedication and just move through that from, from that aspect of things, really, and patience. I, I am confident that things will normalise, uh, but there's just a lot of dumping on us at the moment. Um, it's going to take a a good 12 months, I think, to hopefully then strip a few of these policies or, or a bit of legislative um, overlays back out. Now, one of the things that a lot of people will notice is that um, you don't have that many grey hairs yet. Um, oh, you're still, I yeah, yeah, I, I see the sideburns, <laughs> but part of that is the fact that you're in Victoria, mate. So I, I put it to you this way, mate. When you first started, in terms of, the, the requirement around best interest duty. What are the requirements for you as an advisor with best interest duty today? To, to give us a yeah. bit of information about how that works for a financial planner, because I think by hearing it, you're going to find a lot of finance brokers take a lot from it. Yeah, look, uh, I mean, it obviously started when it was reasonable basis and even reasonable basis, you still had a right, lot so of... Let's, let's, let's take it easy. So <laughs> slow it down. So, reason, <laughs> so, so when you, you talk about reasonable basis, you're talking about a financial advisor requiring a, a reasonable basis for advice. Yeah, based on obviously a set of assumptions um, which have been derived from no difference to a mortgage broker sitting with a client and filling in basically a fact find, um, yeah. understanding goals and objectives, um, and then designing the advice based on all the information I guess you've collected. Um, Back then, it was a little bit easier. When you have the overlay of best interest, um, because there's so many little points within that part of legislation that you have to um, evidence now when providing the advice. Um, it's complexity around now, for example, and, and this is where the mortgage brokers, I think, are going to find it challenging. It's choice. Um, because we have to then start considering, like us, um, and I'm putting myself in the mortgage broker's um, situation who, who sits sort of uh, next to me, um, why is product A or this home loan, you know, more suited to another one sitting over here, which could probably have the end result basically net-net, meaning fees, interest rates, etc. But you then have to have that 
discussion around why you've actually chosen that particular product. And then you actually have to have notes as to why you haven't considered or you didn't recommend the other products. So it is a lot of record keeping. <laughs> yeah, so, so that's, that's a big key takeout that, you know, <laughs> from you and me auditing other planners, we probably, <laughs> we'd like to hope we've got that, that part down ourselves. So the big thing is obviously, you're gonna to have to keep, regardless of what type of finance you're providing, you're gonna to have to provide copious notes as to how you've got there. But probably the interesting part that, that you've sort of glossed over, which is the big one for a lot of the finance brokers is that compliance, there is a whole layer of compliance that isn't simply around the product provider. There's obviously your own, uh, from, from the early days when you're an advisor to now, can you give, give people on this call a bit of an indication about how, how you had to document your advice when you first started compared to now? When I first started many, many years ago? <laughs> days uh, in Wollongong, mate, back in the, those days. Well, I started um, pre-financial services reform. Um, so back in 2000, um, it was literally a customer advice record as, as it was known back then. Um, and it was probably, oh, I do apologize. Sorry about that. It was a, a two to three page um, document basically outlining the advice. Um, and it was mainly product driven. So nothing to do with taking into account specifically the client's goals and objectives. So uh, just, just to, to dig down on that. So you're, the point that, that we're sort of, we're, we're sort of uh, examining is that with best interest duty specifically, do you believe that even though a mortgage broker or a finance broker is essentially looking at matching a product, because, we, because we're going down the path of best interest duty, really, we can't ascertain what's in the best interest of a client without having done some fairly detailed analysis. Yes, and that's where it's obviously come, that, that, and that's why we've gotten there basically, is because there's been a lot of obviously um, poor advice um, and the advice has been probably derived on probably what uh, benefit the advisor would receive from that advice. Um, not to say that that's how the mortgage broking regime has ever worked, but that's sort of, I guess, why it has moved so fast to try and strip out all those conflicts. And you're right, now it's, it's solely based on um, those needs and objectives of the client. So as soon as you start pulling them out, so it's basically goals-based. I think that word is being thrown around a lot lately. So if you know a goal, um, and it could be a client uh, wants to pay down, you know, a particular product, uh, say so non-deductible versus deductible debt faster, you know, what product will ultimately aid in achieving that goal? And that's, I think, where it's, it's going to lead down the path to. It's funny, you, you made some points before, um, and we talked about advice and in terms of the rules. So, okay, the, there's obviously, there was the role of ASIC with financial planners. There's the role of ASIC when it comes to finance brokers. I suppose the middle, the middle men there um, for financial planners were their dealer group. Now, when we look at the concept of a dealer group for, more, for mortgage brokers, finance brokers, it is their aggregator. So I suppose, what are your thoughts there around how an aggregator is going to be able to meet their responsibilities under best interest duty in terms of looking after their brokers? And that, that's, a, that's a biggie. I, I think that's, um, you know, there's a few people on this call. It's a quite a scary proposition because it's so new um, to look after the consumer requirements under NCCP for brokers is one thing. Um, to look at best interest duty, maybe if you could help us understand what you think some of the challenges are. Looking at, and I just to clarify for those people on the call, Shane, I gather you run, you know, the Hopkins Group, which you're part of, has its own dealer group. It, it, it is its own dealer group. Funny you say that because I've actually written a couple of things down here to make sure that I hit on today. And one of them was choice. So when we talk about complexity and choice, 
um, when you are working for an APHIS cell or an aggregator, you would hope that you have sufficient choice now to be able to meet your best interests or, or the best interests of the clients. And that will come down to the products that are available and obviously then dictated to you by, again, yes, you're right, your dealer group. So that process is probably going to um, be playing, I reckon it's going to play out. And like our industry has now seen is the approved product lists um, that these AFSLs used to have and mandate the clients, um, you know, the advisors abide by, they're going to broaden, they're going to widen because how do you meet your best interest now as a mortgage broker or aggregator um, by having a small list of uh, products to be able to recommend from? Basically. It's really, it's, it's, it's interesting you dig down on that because I think in, in finance broking, the aggregators are quite great at it. I don't see too many issues there. High person that's trying to get Shane's attention at the time. Um, <laughs> in, it turns out you're a busy man. In, in terms of that for financial, for, for finance broking versus financial planning, um, the real equivalent I see in our industry is a lot of people are going electronic. A lot of people are trying to digitize the loan process. There's a lot of moves to how that looks and feels. Um, the equivalent I can think of for yourself would be early days when, when industry funds weren't sitting on anyone's panel. Um, and now people have to consider those. I, I'd put this to you. Ubank is an example of, of a lender who's been out there that's been quite cheap in home loans. They won't be the first, they won't be the last. There is tons of lenders that actually don't deal with aggregators on a on a revenue basis. How do you how do you believe that best interest duty will impact that style of relationship? If I'm a client and and I go to my advisor and they don't get me my best product, I ask for the cheapest product. I want something no frills. I mean, it 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 gets back to that whole conversation that financial planners had to have. Well, okay, if I'm recommending something that isn't that Ubank product equivalent uh, or that industry fund equivalent, or I, and the client comes to me with that as one of the things that we're looking at, then that, that's a very difficult, conflicted conversation. Yeah, it's interesting yeah. because it took a little while. Sorry, I'm getting a bit of feedback. It took a little while to um, talk to clients um, about how we could operate in the new world. And that did come down to, um, again, how we were remunerated from industry funds. So that could be the same way um, as mortgage brokers may not be remunerated from a particular product if they're not on their panel. Um, that unfortunately doesn't negate your um, need to consider them. Um, and if it is in the client's best interest, then unfortunately that has to play out and you would have to recommend it. Now, whether the client uh, would go to them direct and then you paid a consulting fee, I think, you know, to put it really simply, I, I think people are going to have to adapt to the new way. And I think there's just going to be different um, ways or, or maybe charge or fee charging models, which are probably going to come into play as the industry starts to, to deal with the challenge of best interest duty. Yeah, spot on. And I think this is, this is the interesting part. There's a lot of brokers that seem to think that, okay, um, we've seen our campaign, we've seen the fact that, um, okay, we, we think trail's gonna be fine for a while. We don't, as a mortgage broker, we don't have to worry about that. That's all well and good. But at the same time, each of the groups and associations are very quick to talk about best interest duty and my, and a, a broker today, uh, as part of my network on LinkedIn, quite, quite quickly picked up on the fact that there has been a change in some of the uh, bank's appetite for owning broking groups, uh, owning aggregation businesses that seem to have, the, the timing is quite, quite interesting on that. Um, how do you feel given the way banks have, have uh, removed themselves from a lot of their financial planning uh, dealership ownership how do you see, do you, do you think that that's something that will happen the same way, just in your opinion, for, yeah, for working groups? I do. I have a feeling there's probably going to be a shrinkage of the industry. Um, and then you're probably going to see, like we're seeing in our industry again, um, 
it'll be about scale. Unfortunately, the the small players in the market or you, you unfortunately your sole traders or your self-employed um, may not be able to sort of survive um, in the new world. Um, and it could be a scaling, you know, you, you've got to j join the, the bigger groups or, or a number of people start to join each other because it, it could come down to um, those different models and just unsustainability of the smaller businesses. And that then flows on to fee increases, again, like we've seen through our industry, and that could come back to, you know, indemnity insurance and all those other um, factors, licensing costs for aggregators. So there's a raft of issues still yet to play out um, with an aggregation business or a model. Look, really appreciate you taking uh, up your time. This was to be a very quick session, but what I will say is that we've had a lot of late people that have joined this session. There's quite a few new to industry brokers that have, have come and, and joined us as well. And I don't want to scare them out of our industry. The whole reason we've got Broker <laughs> Illuminati is to highlight these areas because no one else is having these sort of conversations. And you know, yeah. my, what, what, if I had my crystal ball, I'd, I'd prefer to be using it to be on a beach in the Bahamas rather than uh, predicting the future of what's happening for licensing and, and compliance for finance, finance broking going forward. But I thought that it was very relevant to have you on board um, if there's anyone that's got any questions in the chat, please feel free to to, um, to throw us a line or two because, look, whilst Shane is an incredibly, uh, whilst he is quite young, he's very experienced. And when did you start doing financial planning, buddy? Was it like 19, 20 or something crazy? Yeah, I, I did... Um... Uh, 18 basically so straight out of my HSC I, I started actually as a receptionist believe it or not in the, in the mortgage in Andre's office um, yep. and yeah so from reception into a bookkeeping so the accounting side so but in the financial planning business at 20 um, and then authorized back in 2006 so yeah I've been an advisor for what 14 15 years now yeah and 14 15 years in in our world is 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 enormous um, look if there isn't any questions, uh, this was a deliberately short session because really we're, we're I suppose we're, we're, we're examining some of these issues for financial planning um, and how they might transcribe across to finance, finance brokers in terms of specific to best interest duty. Um, so to summarise, and, and the title of our, our session today was to look at three areas whereby if I'm a finance broker, um, looking at the the implications of best interest duty going forward, what are the three things that you would recommend as a experienced financial planner that we need to have a think about what's on the horizon? Yeah, I think communication is a big one with your clients. Um, financial literacy then feeds off that because if you communicate well and then um, your clients are um uh, are really um, able to understand i guess the um, the message or the information that you're putting in front of them then the best interest duty um, part and you know meeting their goals and objectives um, around choice um, which is my top three there is going to be quite simple so it's just now getting to know your products getting to know where the the pros and cons on each product are so to give you a bit of an idea just to quickly elaborate a bit on i guess again um, to make it uh, less scary is that we have the pros and cons on each of our products um, that we use. We've got an open APL, so we can actually use anything that is um, registered or approved by ASIC, APRA, et cetera. And we do refresh that every month um, or when there's a PDS roll. And if you've got that cheat sheet there on your mortgage products, then it's going to be really simple um, and straightforward to help make that best interest duty checklist each time. It's funny, one of the things you've just brought up there is a big one. So a great example, I, I'm, I, I plan on never writing a home loan. I don't wish to, to get involved in that consumer space. And there's many, and part of the reason for that is I work with many other brokers and that's their specialty. So I, I don't need to assist as many brokers in that space. But the, the reason I bring that what you've just said there is I would imagine in financial planning, a lot more people that whole concept of an open architecture approved product list is very rare. That's not common at all. I would imagine most financial planners would look to specialise as well to make sure they don't have to 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 run the the gambit across all of the different products that are out there. Even as a fin a financial planner, 
um, there would be probably a lot more people that would look to specialise as well, whether it be by client type, product type or what have you. Yeah, and I mean, that, that comes with scale. Um, so in relation to scale in our business, we've gone from four to 11 advisors, um, geographically located differently, um, demographics, so age, um, and again, experience and knowledge. We've got um, advisors that specialise in self-managed super funds, um, insurance, and that's going to be, I think, no different to the mortgage broking industry. I reckon moving forward um, and some of the business models might be improved um, or shaken up a little bit that way as well. Yeah, and look, obviously, you know, we, we've done a lot of speculation and, and we're probably a little bit over time. So I thank everyone for sticking with us. Um, this was a short session, but I think that just, just to add to, to one of the points you've made, one of the things I'm personally um, a very strong advocate for is the concept of a mandate agreement. And a lot of mortgage brokers are very concerned about the concept of a mandate agreement because they, their feedback is, well, if... If I go to a bank, I don't have to pay a fee up front. So why would I pay a fee to a broker? So I just wanted to touch, I wanted to leave with this, this, this question to you. Um, how are you as a financial planner, how do you sort of resolve that? In the past, people could go to a, a bank financial planner and not pay a fee. Um, what are the things that you have done personally? Because for me, I'd like to see mandate agreements as something that are used as not as more than a compliance document. I'd like to see them as something that calls out up front, hey, you're going to deal with me as a broker. This is what we're generally looking at in terms of range. This is where we're thinking in terms of our security. This is our cost structure. And by the way, if I go ahead and do all this work for you, I get you approved, then you know what? Um, I think that there is a fee that that is part of that for, for my advice and, and my work behind it. Now, mortgage brokers uh, have always seen themselves competing with a bank. Um, and, I, and I understand that too. Look, it's a, it is a different suite. Do you believe that uh, that sort of agreement, you've got a mortgage broker in your office as well. Do you feel that, um, that things would go down that path? How would you, as a broker, look at that particular um that quandary in terms of the people you're competing against. It's not something you've had to deal with now, but in the past you certainly would have dealing with bank, having to, to compare yourself to a bank financial planner. Yeah, I mean, look, we, we bring different expertise and knowledge to the table. So um, clients that are gonna to wanna to deal with banks will deal with the bank, but clients that uh, want value, um, and you know, a business, a mortgage coach, for example, or a coach, they're going to respect and appreciate your time um, and advice. And if you communicate to them in a way that, you know, you can then deliver a, your value proposition, because that's basically what it is, um, over what um, you would get if you did walk into that one institution, which means you're just going to get their products um, generally, uh, then I guess that's what you need to really just um, emphasise with your clients. And it could now be, you know, starting to really look at your businesses um, and build out that value proposition. Um, so when you do, you know, start on the 1st of January, 2021, that you have it there ready to go. And that's where you kick off your discussions. Shane, pleasure. Great to see you on a personal note. Hey, great to see you uh, <laughs> on Zoom. I, I'm a, I, I appreciate the effort given uh, you guys were allowed your, your first uh, legal beverage in Victoria just the other night. So I'm, I'm impressed that you've, uh, backed up. I know it's uh, late in the afternoon, but I think for, for many of Victorian, uh, it was a milestone worth celebrating, having some freedom back. I just want to thank you and the Hopkins Group for being part of Broker Illuminati. I, I say this in our sessions, but I'll, I'll continue to do so. Um, Broker Illuminati was set up because an Illuminati, uh, by definition, really is like a secret society. And the information we're sharing really shouldn't be a secret. They're, they're, they're discussions that should be, and, and, and professional development that should be more open for more brokers. So thank you very much. If you got value out of today's session, um, fantastic. Tell people, make sure you, you post on LinkedIn um, using the hashtag Broker Illuminati. I really appreciate you being part of it. Um, especially, to, there's a, a handful of newer to industry brokers um, who have really been quite dedicated and come to a lot of our sessions. Make sure you don't leave out our keynote tomorrow with Craig Johnston. Shane's a bit of a footballer. It's a cracker. Craig Johnston's story is fantastic. 
you want to be part of it. Um, thanks everyone for being part of this. Uh, look forward to seeing a few of you on the calls tomorrow. Appreciate your time, uh, especially what we've gone over. Thanks again, Shane. Talk soon. Thanks, guys. Thanks, hey, guys. See ya. Guys, if you've got any questions and you're still on, on the call uh, and we missed out, look, feel free to shoot me an email uh, or uh, unmute yourselves. Uh, always happy for your feedback and hope you've been getting, uh, getting a lot out of the sessions.